Hi, my name's Bob Grinia, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one because um, <laughs> I did my fatherly duty today, and so I only gave myself half an hour to do the presentation. So what we're going to actually do uh, in this presentation is I'm going to walk you through some of the things I've talked about in the past, and then I'm going to... Um, look to uh, build this presentation as we go. So you're actually going to watch um, the kind of thing that I do when I'm building a, a more organized presentation. Okay, so uh, I, I sent out the paper, uh, or rather I gave a link to it in my remoteview.icu. And this was where in 2012, there was a group I, in a high plateau, a Chinese group, and they were looking with some slits and a 600 line uh, diffraction grating with some cameras and high-speed cameras for lightning actually and the, they uh, happened uh, to uh, be lucky enough to capture a ball lightning form uh, for a uh, just over a second I think it was um, and that gave them the opportunity to capture the first spectra recorded of ball lightning in free air. Now uh, I'm going to walk through that paper. I'm going to try and pull out a few things and then I'm going to talk about what we've discussed in the past, uh, what we've done in experiments and uh, then I'm going to walk through what I see potentially is going on uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, strongly challenge some of the assumptions made by uh, previous uh, explanations for how uh, ball lightning is forming and then I will uh, bring in some of the uh, discussions about coherent matter and I'm not the first to say that uh, the self-organized plasmas uh, may have a coherent matter sheath. There was a book I think in 2012 which looked at the history of this work and found uh, in their conclusion, I think it was 2011, 2012, that it might be the case that uh, the sheath is, is, is coherent matter and certainly the experiments in the Vega experiments uh, and we have a, quite a lot more material to show you on that that uh, moves in this direction. Uh, that looks like it might be the case. Now, I'm sorry if the camera is glitching. Uh, I had to put, put something quick together here. I missed one lead um, and it might cut out uh, because it's stupid hot. It's 31 degrees here at the moment and I might start to sweat uh, uh, profusely. Uh, but I have a backup uh, camera in case it does fail. So can everyone hear me? Sound okay here? Great story, uh, story pantry. Okay, great. So we've got 17 in the house. Um, the spectra shows not carbon, water, hydroxyl, hydro hydrogen. Yes, the we, we'll go into that. Um, uh, they, they explain why they can't see some things and there may be other things that they can't see for a similar reason. Um, but uh, we will look at that in a minute. So uh, let me bring up the first slide, the holding slide um, of uh, this presentation, uh, which uh, and if this machine doesn't overheat as well, that would be good. So uh, it's uh, an explanation for the observed spectra of ball lightning in free air. And I've got my small mouse pointer, so I will deal with that in time. If I shake it, you can see where it is. So um, here is uh, 0 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, 1,120 milliseconds, and so forth, uh, of the progression of the ball lightning as they captured. Where, when you see the 0 milliseconds, they recognize that on this camera they didn't capture it forming, uh, they just caught it. This is 0 milliseconds as far as their recording is concerned. So I'm looking at the frames down in the bottom right. And this is a colored spectrum that you can see on um, Wikipedia for ball lightning. And uh, it's not surprising that you have nitrogen and oxygen here. Uh, uh, that is in the air. Uh, there's something that they identify in the paper, and we'll talk about that, uh, that this uh, signal is coming in and out. Um, but then it's these other elements, calcium, silicon, and iron, uh, and uh, some very strong lines uh, from these particular elements. And I'm going to argue that uh, these elements being seen are related to this uh, elements in the air. So uh, let's go forth. Now, the first time that I mentioned 
uh, ball lightning and really got excited about it was in January uh, 2000 and oh god was it six I think it was six <laughs> um, at Stanford uh, invited by Carl Page thank you Carl and uh, um, the link is here and we can go and have a look at a mugshot of that uh, let's uh, have a look at that now um, so that is that is the presentation so um, when you uh, uh, here, here's the shot of the presentation and I at this point was discussing the George Osawa cycle and in here you can see oxygen and nitrogen uh, here uh, both large constituents of the air and if you fuse these various things along with carbon which you can also see in a small proportion in the air you can get many of the elements for life and I went on to talk about uh, ball lightning and uh, the work of Dr. George Eagley and th this was really because uh, it just in the previous uh, year so this was actually January 28th I, this was published uh, 2017 so actually in October 2016 I had visited Dr. George Eagley in uh, Hungary and I did a series of videos called Stardust which you can go and see on our channel um, anyway, um, so that that was that, uh, and then I, um, after a period of time, uh, I, I I did this um, presentation called Uf UFOs over Hestalen, Norway, uh, explained ball lightning and low energy nuclear reactions. Okay, so uh, this is when I really started to get into it, and this is uh, the first time that I. I um, uh, sort of made the connection between the squiggles. I hadn't really realized that these were coherent matter traveling waves um, at that time, but uh, it certainly uh, looked to be that these squiggles that are recorded on camera, and I think there's another one um, somewhere somewhere here maybe, uh, um, that you see the same sort of thing. Um, but I'm calling these similar to strange radiation tracks or exotic vacuum object tracks. And uh, so the, the connection was kind of forming. I think it's appropriate now to have a look at the uh, paper. So we'll do that. Um, okay, so uh, yes, the, the camera might die. <laughs> so we'll see. Is it? Can everyone see the presentation? Um, are you hearing? Who, who's hearing an echo? Anyone else hearing an echo? Is it just John Watson? Um, okay. Hi and no, I guess no, maybe not hearing the echo. Okay, all right. So um, I will go to the PDF which I have here of um, the uh, relevant paper and we can talk through that. Now, as ever, my uh, Intel Mac is very, very, very slow, <laughs> even though it's very powerful. Um, Okay, so this is the paper that the image, uh, the data that provided the image for the cover slide came from. So let's have a look at it. Okay, here we go. So um, it was in physical uh, uh, review letter letters. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, physical review letters, um, and uh, it was in twenty fourth of January two thousand and fourteen. Now, uh, it's observation of the optical and spectral characteristics of ball lightning. So in the introduction here, it says, typically ball lightning is associated with thunderstorms, either immediately after a cloud to ground lightning strike or while lightning activity is present in the vicinity, it is usually observed within close range of the ground. I agree with this sentence. It is usually observed within close range of the ground. I do not agree uh, uh, I agree with the next bit in the shape of a sphere or an ellipsoid with a diameter of between 1 and 100 centimeters. I don't necessarily agree with this and I'll tell you why. Moving horizontally uh, with speeds of a few meters per second, this is possible. The lifetime can range from 1 to 10 seconds and the color can be white, yellow, red, orange, purple or green. I, I agree with all this down here. Um, I have a, a, a bit of a bone of contention with the scale and uh, not uh, not uh, I don't buy the fact that it only occurs uh, where there is a lightning strike on the ground. And here is something is that um, Ken Shoulders actually discussed. Ken Shoulders is the guy that uh, um, looked into John Hutchison's work and he um, uh, established that this was uh, uh, caused by some um, 
effectively coherent matter and that this was uh, an oscillating magnetic monopole in his conclusion of his book in 1986 and that um, these things were equivalent to natural ball lightning and uh, that um, uh, uh, his work um, really was um, fundamental uh, f to me uh, to be able to understand uh, what was going on in these um, systems. However, when he was referring to ball lightning and lightning, he says that all lightning uh, actually is the discharge channel is formed by a ball lightning and on his website he had some high-speed camera photography of uh, lightning strikes and what you saw is something that came down uh, uh, through the sky uh, and that in his uh, idea, his mind was a ball lightning and whether it's coming from the sky to the cloud to the ground or the ground to the cloud or the cloud to the cloud it was a ball lightning that ionized the channel through which the multiple flashes of the lightning discharge went through and uh, this uh, has um, distinct problems for some of the theories that require the actual uh, cloud to ground discharge to occur before the ball lightning is formed. He is saying that it's the ball lightning that forms the uh, all lightning discharges. Okay, so, um, but that's the first time I read that. However, uh, uh, when I'm discussing here in the uh, Hestalen, uh, UFOs over Hestalen work, uh, and we'll go to that, um, it is the case that uh, this wasn't normally during storms. And in fact, if I search for storms here, uh, maybe or lightning strike, um, maybe. Uh, uh. Well, and anyway, they, they didn't say uh, that uh, the ball lightning in uh, Hestalen was due always to lightning strikes, that this would occur um, in times when there was no lightning and in fact this is the same kind of words uh, and, and sort of understanding that was given to me by Aid, an Australian who sent me this sequence so if I if I play this sequence here th this was captured um, uh, last year and he sent it to me like almost within 12 hours of capturing it and he regularly sees ball lightning and like Hestalen where the ball lightning can be actually uh, 10 meters across he sees these things which are very very large now that might be the area in the valley that they are illuminating um, but anyway he, his impression is that they're much larger than these very small structures that are being claimed by this uh, Chinese paper anyway I'll play this and you'll you'll see an example of what ball lightning does you can see that, that it appears to be moving up and down and that's what I've got here on these uh, frames here uh, and it, it's again like that spiraling we saw on the, the Hestal and lights. And I, I actually merged these many frames together uh, in an image uh, somewhere, which might actually be in in, in, in a link to the video. So, uh, uh, da, 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 da. okay, so yeah, I've actually got it here. So this is going to give me an image. Is it going to give me an image? Hopefully. <laughs> We'll play the video first. So uh, the video is here. Okay. So that was that, um, and if we go here, you can see the track that I've aligned. And I've actually done GIF, and GIF images where I've got the whole thing uh, as one one still image. I don't know whether I have it here in the description. Um, and there's an image here that I, I produced and it, it appears to be that when he captured it, he was very lucky that as he was driving, the bull lightning was moving and his movement allowed him to, to see for the length of the sequence the, um, the appearance of the uh, uh, actual bull lightning between uh, the gaps in the trees. So I don't know whether I can see this on this video. 
way. Don't know. Okay. So I, I've actually synced this together, but this is where he's driving at night, but much faster. But essentially, the, it's this gap in the tree here. I don't know if you can see me waving my mouse pointer. Where, where my mouse pointer is right there. That's where the ball lightning occurred. So he was, he was quite lucky to see it. Um, but anyway, the, the point being that I'm trying to make here is that both in the case of Hestalen and in the case of Aid in Australia, much more contemporaneously, uh, sorry, co contemporary, um, there was no lightning. It was just uh, just a day when you know there's a temperature change in the evening and and so forth. So there's there's no lightning going on. So it it isn't the case that ball all ball lightning. It might be the case that some ball lightning is formed uh, by the strike to ground, but not in uh, this case. And this becomes very very important when you are considering what is fueling the ball lightning. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the um, uh, PDF of the paper here. Okay, so actually, uh, Pentry dash cam is not always known for being super HD. This was a five megapixel uh, dash cam, and it really did have those pixels. Um, uh, what you're seeing in that second shot is not so good a quality because it's been mashed by um, the quality from uh, uploading to Google Drive. But anyway, okay, so now this is the, the, the paper in question where um, the most recent of the internal energy theories was proposed by Abrahamson and Dennis. And I've, I've described this before. And essentially, um, what they say is you get a cloud to ground discharge the, the energy goes into the ground um, and it, it vaporizes uh, and ionizes uh, and separates uh, silicon and carbon into these nanoparticles. And it, it, it then, as it comes back out, it forms like a smoke ring, which is actually not too far from the truth of the structure of um, uh, the solitons in exotic vacuum objects. It forms this smoke ring um, and then you have these unoxidized silicon and unoxidized carbon and this is oxidized by the air and this gives you uh, a slow burn and produces the ball lightning for a period of time. This I do not think is a sufficient uh, uh, argument uh, uh, for how this works and so yeah so you're saying here the slow oxidation of silicon nanoparticles provides the internal energy for its existence not just silicon but carbon as well. In support of this theory, there was this Brazilian group, I think it is, uh, from memory, uh, Paver et al., and they reported that electric arc, the voltage uh, in the range of 20 to 25 volts, the current varies from 100 to 140 amps, and the frequency is 60 hertz, discharges in pure silicon can generate luminous balls with several of the properties usually reported for natural ball lightning. So this is saying that, oh, silicon again, and this is what the uh, Abrahamson and Dennis were saying. So, oh, silicon, we got silicon and silicon. But no, um, because if we go back to here, um, we can look at John Hutchison's work, uh, I think in the 1980s, and he generated a, uh, a ball lightning ge generator. Uh, and this uh, just had a discharge gap. And he had some a charge accumulator spheres here. Um, this was a, a four inch diameter solid copper ball, solid copper ball. So th these would accumulate charge. And I think these were tungsten here. And then he would have this Van de Graaff generator. And this would again uh, um, charge, I think, statically these uh, rings that they've got on here, these corona rings. And it, it would accelerate um, this bead uh, um, uh, through uh, this... Uh, tube here. Anyway, my point being is that this is producing ball lightning from a discharge, but there is uh, no silicon involved in this particular generator. And uh, according to John, this worked every day of the week. And uh, he, he sent me lovely photos actually of it um, somewhere. <laughs> maybe maybe not. Oh, there, there we go. So th this is the electronics that drove the uh, device. Lovely, lovely little valves here. And uh, so that, that was that. So that was the vacuum tube Tesla coil drive. And it had a spark gap. And this is the Tesla coil here. 
and uh, this is the, the, the main circuit board. And you can see this all on my UFOs over Hostile and Norway Explained Ball Lightning and Low Energy Nuclear Reactions uh, thing. So um, what I'm saying is neither do you have to have silicon or uh, you don't have to either either silicon or um, be doing it with a lightning discharge into the ground. There is no ground here to form this torus that, uh, to make the ball. Okay, so um, it may be that uh, this is one way that they can produce something that looks a lot like ball lightning. And uh, I've already told you about the work of uh, Dr. George Eagley, and we have that in a Nova reactor and supernova, and then there's another guy called Chukanov, and they have made uh, ball lightning, and in fact, um, things that look like ball lightning, and in, in the case of Chukanov, he, he's made it, uh, as far as I understand it, very, very stable for long periods of time, and it, in our work with Dr. George Eagley, we were using charcoal. Now, charcoal is not so rich in silicon, um, but it obviously has carbon, so you have these things that could technically burn. But it was seeming to produce uh, carbon and uh, silicon. So uh, I think I have um, those kind of uh, arguments made somewhere. But anyway, um, da, 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 da. okay. So yes, so th this is actually out of um, the, uh, sorry if I show you. <laughs> Uh, this is actually out of um, the Nova reactor, which creates a, a kind of ball lightning structure. And this is a crenellated uh, magnetite iron rich sphere. And this is a rich silicon blob. So we've got iron and silicon. And both of these, if you look at them, contain a large amount of oxygen. So in both spectrum one here, the large silicon concentration blob, spectrum one, is the yellow one it is uh, uh, basically silicon dioxide it's almost like quartz but then it is in a quartz container so that could be coming from there the other one is 31 percent 31.1 percent weight uh, of oxygen and 51.5 percent of iron so this is this kind of magnetite mahemite uh, crenellated structure that is produced and the interesting thing is is and I've discussed this before this is in me 356's experiment and he was using uh, I believe tungsten uh, and uh, water in this experiment and this is um, a tungsten electrode and and of course he's using tungsten tungsten here but um, the reason I'm introducing those is that this particular structure here is uh, a crenellated iron microsphere from an impact of a ball lightning with the ground. Okay, so um, this is seeing the production of iron. Now, let's go back to the uh, original slide that I showed you of the uh, spectra that was generated from the uh, uh, ball lightning that was captured and discussed in this paper, we are seeing silicon and we are seeing iron. We are also seeing cal calcium. Okay, now there's no discussion in, in the uh, uh, Abrahamson uh, and Dennis paper of calcium and um, there's little discussion of iron, but there is silicon and also carbon in there. And of course, you've got these nitrogen. So, um, we are seeing a system where we, we can start with something that doesn't have a lot of iron uh, and doesn't have a lot of silicon, but we can create a ball lightning structure and it creates something that's similar to what was found in Herstalen, which doesn't have lightning generally producing its ball lightning, uh, like the work in Australia, but uh, they are seeing uh, iron rich uh, structures being formed. And so I believe this is more to do with the fact that the EVO creates uh, coherence and the coherence uh, creates transmutation. Uh, let's go back to the paper and uh, uh, we will build this argument. So, okay. Um, so my next point I wanted to make is from the paper. Okay. Okay. So back to the paper. Um, there are other some uh, other ones where they are talking about um, 
the apparent diameter of these luminous balls are in the range of one to four centimeters. The color of light, bluish, white, or orange. White can be seen during the lifetime of two to five seconds immediately. Stephen and Massey carried out similar experiment producing silicon-based luminous balls with diameter. Okay, so basically they're finding, finding something that produces something similar, but you don't have to do that to create something that's similar. So you, uh, is, is my main argument here. There's other ones that are saying for external energy theory, Loke et al. proposed the ball lightning uh, is regarded as a pulsed electric discharge, with uh, which is very similar to what uh, Hutchison was doing and actually creating it with a, a, a frequency on the microsecond time scale, which can provide and explain uh, an explanation for the formation, lifetime, energy source, and motion of natural ball lightning. And so the one is uh, Kapitza. This was, uh, I think, a Russian guy, and he, and he was saying that it is a uh, a self uh, resonating microwave uh, chamber, I believe, uh, hypothesizing that intense radio frequency, okay, so uh, RF and microwave RF, um, uh, electromagnetic field could supply the necessary energy to form and sustain the ball lining. Anyway, it, it actually, for, for what I'm going to argue today, it doesn't really matter uh, what the mechanism that initiates the production. Uh, but what I am saying is that it is not possible to say that you have the all sorry it's not um correct to say that all ball lightning is formed by lightning strikes and by interaction with the ground you can actually discard that and uh, it's not true to say in my my opinion that you need silicon uh there to begin with uh, and and so there we go um so let's go on. I think the the next thing that I want to draw out this paper is uh, some discussion about what, how they could see certain things. So essentially, you've got here uh, in the summer of 2012 at uh, uh, Qinghai Plateau of China, uh, they were carrying out experiments and blah, blah, blah. And they saw this thing of ball lightning and they captured it. Um, and here's the spectrum. I think the, the most relevant for me part of this is that um, it, there's two aspects. One is uh, if I search for aluminium here, um, uh, aluminium, is it aluminium? Yes, it's the American spelling. Right, so um, consequently, there are reasons to believe that the observed ball lightning is generated by CG striking lightning in the soil on the ground. In addition, aluminum is also one of the main components of soil. The absence of aluminum component in the spectra of ball lightning can be explained as follows. In the ball lightning spectra, the near infrared lines with excitation energies of 11.7 to 11.9 eV appear periodically, making the excitation energies of persistent lines lower than 11.7 eV. Um, the spectral line re response ranges of the two cameras, 400 to 690 and 400 to 1000 nanometers respectively. Based on reference 25 in the uh, aluminum spectrum, there are no strong lines of aluminium in the 400 to 1000 nanometer range and only strong lines of aluminium 2 are present. Yet the excitation energies of these aluminium 2 lines are in the ra range of um, yum yum yum. 15 to 18.2 eV. Oh dear, sorry. My machine goes very slow and it, it's because of, I don't know why uh, Acrobat Pro uses so much power. Um, anyway, oh God. <laughs> oh dear, R -r roll on M1. Okay, so uh, essentially what they're saying is it, the the um, first ionization uh, doesn't appear in the spectral capability of their camera uh, of their spectrometers, and the second ionization here uh, is too high in energy, and therefore the uh, aluminium aluminium lines are not observed in the spectral ball lightning. So what they're saying is they could be there, and if they were there and we had detected them, that would add support, but I don't think it does, and I'll come on to that later. Um, but it would add support to uh, their possibly being present uh, uh, aluminium and that might add to the support that it's actually been a strike that hit the ground and, and so forth. But I don't think that's the case. Anyway, I might, well, I'll come on to that. So there's that point. And then the other point I think which is really uh, I, I want to draw out is um, is maybe this. So 
Where is it? Blah, 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 blah. The experiment of STEM and the Messi may confirm this. The observation of ball lightning may be associated with the Abraham uh, Hamson Dennis theory suggesting a soil lightning strike mechanism. Besides, it is interesting that the light intensity shows a persistent oscillation during the stable stage. The observed frequency is 99.4 hertz, which is easily associated with the power line frequency of 50 hertz, as shown in the supplemental material figure. Two. Now, um, as someone has, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm re re referring to this visit, uh, piece here. Um, as so someone who's lived in Asia for a long period of time, uh, in it, my, my place in India, and I've lost my camera now. Great. <laughs> um, uh, I. She's, hopefully you can still hear me. Can you still hear me? Oh no. Oh no. What's happened? Can you still hear me? Tell me if you can still hear me. Uh, okay. Can you still hear me? Can't see. Yeah, okay. All right. You can he hear me. So I'm just going to talk now uh, to the paper because my camera's overheated. And there we go. Uh, that's what happens. So, um, Good. Okay. So, uh, in when I was living in Asia, uh, in southern India, it was quite common for the voltage. It's meant to be two hundred and thirty-two volts. It could range from like one hundred and seventy volts all the way up to beyond two hundred and thirty-two volts. But it could also change in uh, um, cycles per second. Uh, so it's not unsurprising to me that uh, it might not be an actual 50 hertz power supply there and a, a, a half frequency. So effectively, you're doubling that, um, that the peak to trough. So the peak and trough uh, could easily be 99.4 hertz, as is being talked about here. As shown in the supplemental material Fig 2, there are a set of high voltage 35 kilovolt transmission lines near the location of the ball lightning. Um, and the horizontal distance from the nearest transmission line to the location is about 20 meters. This allows us to infer that the fluctuation of the ball lightning in the stable stage is uh, possibly induced by second harmonic effects associated with the high voltage transmission line. I would agree with this. So uh, the two things that we need to address, we've addressed the fact that we don't need to have a lightning strike. And we've addressed the fact that there's no aluminium in there. And we've addressed the fact uh, that there was this oscillation, uh, this 94 hertz, uh, 99.4 hertz uh, oscillation. So I'm going to talk about how um, I, I would explain that with the coherent matter uh, self-organized cluster uh, structure okay uh, so th that is it now if I go up a little bit you can see uh, in the paper how the particular um, my my <laughs> talk about overheating so uh, you can see the progression uh, and the oscillation that's going on here so so 642.351 milliseconds in there's basically no oxygen and nitrogen lines. And then uh, like 0.3 of a, or 0.33 of a millisecond later, 0.333 of a millisecond later, in fact, uh, there starts to be some uh, oxygen lines coming in, then the nitrogen cut lines coming in. Okay. And then it seems to peak at 647.684. So this is the oscillation they're talking about. Now, throughout the whole period, the iron and the silicon and the calcium lines are persistent. Now, when it gets to the end of the ball lightning dying, as it were, you get the, this last die down uh, of the whole thing. So you, you get the oxygen dying down, you get the um, uh, iron, the silicon and the calcium dying down. And right at the end here, the oxygen's died, uh, died down and the nitrogen's died down, but you still see one peak for silicon and one peak for iron, right right at the end there. So silicon and iron are almost the last thing that seems to go out. And why do I think this is important? I think the reason silicon and iron are the last thing to go out is that they are the, the end of the chain, as it were, uh, and they are the last things. Now, you might consider that they are the things, the silicon, the iron, and the calcium, are the things that, in my view, are being formed. 
Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let me go and show you. Uh, let's see if I can get the, the, my face camera back so there's just something to look at whilst I'm switching between. Ah, uh, dear. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's my mugshot for a few seconds before it overheats again. Um, I've got to find some solution to this. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's a nice camera, but it overheats. Uh, okay, so, um, so what I'm saying is that uh, the iron and the um, calcium and the silicon uh, die down with the rest and you the last thing you see is the peak of the silicon and the iron and you can see what they're saying here and and uh, uh, so ball lightning natural ball lightning is known to oscillate and and maybe that is in as as they say in in this case due to the power line nearby and if you can imagine um it could be the case that when the power is at its peak in one half of the phase and it and it's in its trough in as in the sort of negative part of the phase so you've got the positive and the negative part of the phase that that is producing some sort of influence over the core but the core is something that is silicon iron and calcium and the core of the core is something that's silicon and iron okay so um, hold that in mind as we go to the next part of uh, the discussion here so let me do that and uh, maybe So what I want to draw your attention to is something that I've drawn people's attention to a lot. And in my understanding of how Lena works, um, when you get a coherent matter structure, either in the toroid or the spherical form, these two forms of exotic vacuum objects or itonic clusters, as is uh, the phrase used by Takaaki Matsumoto, um, there, there is this sheath and the sheath uh, is kind of like an area where there's very low degrees of freedom but you've got a lot of material coming in and that forces uh, in my view coherence and depending on the intensity of the thing that's able to cohere this will compress the matter that is forced to cohere into a very small box but the box can be of different sizes if you know what I mean if that makes any sense and um, the, the matter that goes in has to reorganize itself depending on the pressure. And we've seen this in the uh, vortex structures um, on the 10 yen coin. Maybe I don't know whether I've shown that, but certainly on the uh, vortex structures of the Amaza vibrating plates, where you saw diamond at the center, which is carbon 12, which is uh, tri alpha. Then you saw magnesium which is uh, double carbon is magnesium 24 and then you saw on the outside of that chromium which is like double uh, magnesium okay so um uh, that that for me is is almost like pressure that depending on the level of pressure you get different things forming and i i, I have argued that w what lena does is shown by what you see in the earth's crust and Therefore, the most likely elements to be formed, in my view, are the elements that are most abundant in the crust. And let's see what they are. So from this sciencenotes.org, abundance of elements in the Earth crust periodic table and list, we can see that the most abundant element in the Earth's crust is oxygen. And it's very, very abundant compared to even the second most abundant element of silicon. Then you have aluminium. Then you have iron and then you have calcium. So here we go. What we have seen, it, it, obviously we know we've got o o oxygen uh, because we're in the air. And then we've got uh, silicon. We've seen the lines for silicon. We've seen the lines for iron and we've seen the I lines for calcium. Now this does, it, to be, give them credit, along with the aluminium, support the Abraham, uh, Abraham Dennis theory. If it wasn't the case, that you can form ball lightning in free air. Because in free air, what do you have? Well, in free air, this is what you have. You have 78.808% nitrogen. That is not any of these elements, is it? It's none of these elements. In fact, I think you have to go down quite some way before you, you find nitrogen. Okay, 
But this is obviously nitrogen in the crust rather than nitrogen in the atmosphere. But I'm, these things, in my view, and in the, the, the experience of um, uh, uh, John Hutchison, and in the experience of those people that go to Herr Stalin, and the experience of aid in Australia, uh, uh, these things are forming in the air where you do have nitrogen, but you don't have a whole lot of silicon, you don't have a, lot, a whole lot of aluminium, and you don't have a lot, a whole lot of iron, and you don't have a whole lot of calcium, do you? Okay, so, um, so you've got nitrogen, and then you have oxygen, okay, and then you have these trace elements, uh, uh, the, these noble elements, uh, things like argon, xenon, neon, hydrogen blah 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 the only thing that is really of any significance is argon and we could look at that in its own right um, and in fact I did when I when I was just trialing what I wanted to say here I didn't even include argon but we might like to add that into the mix to see if we get any different answers but a lot of people worry about carbon dioxide but it's only 0.038 percent it's really not a lot of the atmosphere and this is very important food for plants and so um there the, the really isn't a lot of carbon there uh, as, it, uh, as it stands. The most of what the air is, is nitrogen and oxygen. And in fact, if you look at the fraction of the isotopes of nitrogen, um, nitrogen-14, which is the bosonic nuclei of nitrogen, is 78% of the air you breathe. 78% of the air you breathe. Now, um, hold that in mind. And hopefully my camera will last long enough for me to bring up this. And uh, we'll start running some calculations, shall we? And I think what we'll end up with is uh, uh, probably a reasonably good answer as to what is going on uh, with ball lightning in the air. Okay. So... Just hold with me a second. <laughs> I'm going to try and group these actually into a different window. So let me see if I can do that. This is when my machine goes. <laughs> is it going to do it for me? Oh dear. <laughs> I'm actually going to turn my air conditioning unit on. Tell me if it makes a terrible new noise. Just while I set this up. Because it's running very slow. That's probably a terrible din in the background. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, there'll be an extra bit of hydrogen in there. That's right, Martin. That's right. But, uh, oh dear, this is, the, this is literally taking minutes to separate one tab. Oh dear. My poor computer. Why, why did they make these extremely expensive apples so very, very bad thermally? I guess they'd blame Intel, Intel wouldn't they? Okay, so, oh, come on. <laughs> it's just frozen. Doesn't even make any sense. Come on. You, you know, I might, I might do the, the, I might just do the, uh, the queries uh, from scratch again. No, no, now it's not allowing me to do anything. I'll oh, do it. You know, the winter is uh, quite good because there's long evenings and uh, <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> you can just put on a jumper, but the computers don't complain then. Okay. Okay, no, come on. Okay, I'm going to have to do this in Firefox because it would appear that um, my 
Okay. Maybe I can do it here. I can do it here. Okay. All right. So. What I'm going to do, I might zoom into that. Can it let me zoom in? Yeah, let me zoom in. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Here we go. So what I'm, I'm taking you to here is WW, and you can do this along with me if you've got a spare computer or you've got a phone near you. It does, you can, can just about see it on a tablet. It's quite nice. Uh, so this is the MFMP's uh, reaction, nuclear reaction calculator for Lena. And it was based on work provided by uh, Dr. Alexander Parkamov. And I worked with Philip Power to develop this uh, um, online calculator. And so um, what I'm saying is, you have 98%, 98% of the air you are breathing right now, doesn't matter where you are in the world, pretty much, uh, is nitrogen-14. So, uh, if we have a system that is able to ionise nit nitrogen-14, making it po positive, and then sucks it in to a coherent matter system, depending on the pressure or, and the intensity of that coherent matter system, the most intense pressure with nitrogen fuel would release magnesium 24 and helium 4 okay but if it was slightly less intense it would receive it release hydrogen 1 and that's a, a, a proton and aluminium 27 so already already just using nitrogen in a coherent matter structure you are synthesizing aluminium 27 and by the way you are synthesizing 15.9509 million electron volts. That's a lot of energy. That really is a lot of energy. Okay. Now, if you go a, a little bit down the line uh, to the next line down here, you get nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 14 synthesizing carbon 12, carbon 12, and oxygen 16. Okay. So already. We have the aluminium that is expected to be seen if it went into the ground, but we know it doesn't need to go into the ground. But we have aluminium-27. So if you do see aluminium-27 in another ball lightning spectral capture, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is because it hit the ground, which is good because they don't always hit the ground and not even technologically produced ones. Now, the other thing is we don't have enough carbon, okay? And I'll show you why in a little minute. So... Um, uh, but in this case, the second most likely thing, if there's a little less pressure going on in that coherent matter sheath, in that kind of double layer, then you would get carbon forming. We've all, already got oxygen in the air. That's over 20% of the air you're breathing right now. And it's so low, this last one here, I would doubt that this would get produced. Okay, So essentially, I believe that you're going to get carbon produced and uh, aluminium produced and hydrogen and oxygen. With just nitrogen-14 and lightning, you can see that you can get carbon dioxide and high, uh, H2O forming just from starting from nitrogen. You've got the, the, the core things for life. You've got uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen if you've got those things uh, in the mix. Okay, Let's go back to the most abundant elements in the crust. What are they? Uh, they are oxygen, silicon, aluminium, iron, and calcium. So what we're missing here is silicon. Why is silicon so abundant? And why are we seeing silicon in the spectrum of the ball lining that was observed by uh, these people? Oh, finally, it's come up. Well, uh, one way to find this is that if you have carbon, which we know we can synthesize by two nitrogen fusing, uh, in, sorry, doing an exchange reaction. If you take carbon and oxygen isotopes, you create all of the isotopes of silicon. Okay, so, uh, and, and again, it, the silicon 28 is, is the most abundant silicon. Carbon 12 is the most abundant carbon. And oxygen 16 is the most abundant car uh, oxygen. 
So the two most abundant carbon and oxygen isotopes and the carbon that is synthesized from the nuclear exchange reaction of two nitrogen 14s uh, yield silicon 28 and 16.7557 million electron volts of energy. Okay, then, uh, so already we have silicon, we have carbon, we already had the nitrogen and we had the oxygen. Okay, now what happens uh, if we do, I've got another one here, let me show you this. Uh, not that one, I don't want to show you that one yet. <laughs> oh dear, it's so slow. Let me, let me go back here and switch back to this one window okay mm -hmm. oh there's the camera gone sorry <laughs> you, you can see what I'm doing here right I'm gonna turn the camera off it might, might get another buzz I literally turned the air conditioning off just for a few minutes okay so um, what are we doing over here? I don't want don't want to reveal too much too quickly, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, so if you've got um, two night, so I did the exchange reaction yielding carbon and oxygen and protons and hydrogen, but if you get nitrogen and nitrogen isotopes fusing, fusing, you get silicon twenty eight as the most likely reaction as the most likely reaction. So if you take your air of nitrogen and you fuse it, you get silicon 28, 29 and 30. Okay, and the ones below are using 15 nitrogen, which is less abundant. And also if you get nitrogen and oxygen fusing, you get silicon 30. So here you can see a massive yield. So the first one here, uh, which is an exchange reaction, uh, you can get 10.776 right 7765 and then uh, if you want another way to produce uh, silicon uh, sorry you can get silicon here Nit nitrogen nitrogen silicon and I showed you the other one which is over here oh dear did I and I've just killed it oh dear <laughs> I'm trying really hard <laughs> I haven't even got another window to go to. Okay. And we've shown carbon and oxygen can yield silicon, but you don't need it anyway. You can get uh, silicon. Uh, so we've got, I've, I've got both of the reactions there. Oh dear. This is when I need a little bit more time to put these all into nice little screen grabs that I could just point to and go, there you go. But anyway, you get what you get. <laughs> Uh, let's go in there. So here you can see on this slide uh, carbon and oxygen fusing to silicon and nitrogen nitrogen uh, uh, fusing to silicon. Okay, so it's not surprising to me that you get all of this silicon. And if you add the ten point seven seven six from the first reactions to the uh, uh, to the twenty seven point five three uh, two two, you're, you're already talking thirty seven thirty thirty eight MeV at least uh, uh, to produce. Uh, you know, d different ways and different paths to get to silicon, uh, for instance. Okay, so. Um, then, how are we getting our uh, calcium? Okay, that is, I believe, the next step along the road. And guess what? You won't believe this. You really won't believe this. If you start with the most abundant form of nitrogen, nitrogen 14, 78% of the air you're breathing now, and you fuse that with the most abundant form of silicon, silicon 28, which is essentially two nitrogen 14s, you get calcium 42. And if you run down the equations here, all the way down to carbon 12 and silicon 28 gives you calcium calcium 40. Okay, so what I'm arguing here is that just by starting with nitrogen and oxygen in the air, you are easily synthesizing the silicon. 
very, very easily synthesizing the silicon. And once you have the silicon, you can very, very easily in a next step, like a cascade reaction, i.e. there are more bosonic nuclei coming into, or even non-bosonic nuclei, but let's say just the bosonic nuclei, they're coming into this coherent matter sheath. And it's trying to reorganize the nucleons in there, or is doing it as, as it's dying. Um, and you're getting the scenario where you are synthesizing the calcium. Now, for the last step, how do you think you're going to be able to get iron? How do you think you're going to be able to get iron? Any guesses? Any guesses? Any guesses? Any guesses? Can, can, can someone do the maths in the head? No? Can you still hear me? <laughs> no? Well, it's a, it was a good chance. It, it, it's just more of the same. It's more of the same. Look. If you take the most abundant uh, nitrogen isotope in the air, 78% of the air you're breathing, and the most likely calcium isotope to form, which is the most abundant in nature, calcium-40, you end up with iron-54. But if you take your carbons and your nitrogens and you fuse them with the isotopes of calcium that you've synthesized, you get all of the isotopes of iron. So in these several steps here, the nitrogen-nitrogen fusing to carbon and uh, aluminium and oxygen and, and protons and the equivalent here, if I can get it, where has where it gone? Oh no. Let's see if I can get it back. Uh, there, no, sorry, I did have it there. There we go. The other option is the carbon, the oxygen fusing to silicon, or the nitrogen, nitrogen fusing uh, to silicon. Uh, here, once you've got the silicon, you can then use nitrogen and carbon with silicon isotopes to make your calcium. And once you've got the calcium, you can make the nitrogen and the carbon fuse with the calcium to make your iron. So, when you are looking at this, when you are looking at this, let me go to this, Ta da in a second. It'll play it, honest, honest. <laughs> uh, it's gonna come, okay. So when you are looking at this, the fuel is the air. The fuel is the air. And it's got nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, these lines. So basically nitrogen, oxygen, they are the lines you see, okay? And what's happening, in my view, is that the nitrogen, uh, predominantly, and the oxygen to a lesser degree, are uh, uh, there's some fusion going on, and that they are producing the silicon, uh, iron, and calcium that you see for these lines. And what happens when you have the power line, when it reaches its maximum and it's changing, that is causing uh, some uh, field change direction. Like so, you got what they're saying is that the ball lightning was uh, twenty meters away from a power line, and the power line is high voltage, uh, uh, and it's got a cycle. So the high voltage would put a high potential tension on the ball lightning. Okay, and. Uh, when it's crossing zero, maybe it doesn't do anything. Or, in fact, it crosses zero every half cycle. Uh, um, yeah, so up and then down and then up. So it's crossing zero every half cycle. So either on the peaks or on the crossing of, of, of the zero point, uh, in, that's not zero point energy, this is just when there's no uh, um, uh, potential there, that um, it, it, it is or it might be on the slope down and the slope up. This is when you are seeing the oxygen and nitrogen lines coming in and out. And when is that? I believe that what it is doing is the energy is being released as photons and uh, it's ionizing the nitrogen and oxygen in the air. So you see those lines once every half cycle, either on the peak of the cycle or on the crossing of the cycle. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you've got the peak and the trough or the zero crossing points. It's, it's one or the other. 
okay? <laughs> and some experiments would need to be done to find out which, which one it was. And maybe you could conceptualize why it was one and not the other. And like I say, I'm, I'm doing this in real time for you. I'm doing this presentation, which I wanted to make by having about five hours today. I'm, I'm doing it in real time. So you're seeing the real time process of working out how it works. Um, and so um, that is why you always see the silicon and the iron and the calcium because they are on the coherent matter sheath and they are all ionized. And so uh, as they are all sharing all their electrons around in, in this uh, um, ele dense uh, electron condensate with these ions attached to it, and which is fusing these atoms and also doing nucleon exchanges, um, the, the synthesized atoms are, uh, um, which all of these, in my view, all of these atoms are synthesized. And they're all synthesized predominantly from nitrogen. Okay? So they're all synthesized. Oxygen can play a role, um, but uh, I believe that they're predominantly synthesized from nitrogen. And uh, when when they are um, uh, they're releasing some of their energy, maybe as uh, uh, intense thermal energy or uh, as uh, higher energy photons. Uh, and you know, read Ken Shoulder's work to understand what they can produce. Um, these are exciting the nitrogen oxygen around it in this 99.4 uh, hertz uh, frequency. And that, in my view, explains the observations of the Chinese in 2012. It is also an explanation that would be uh, capable of explaining all of uh, the observations uh, of ball lightning, um, uh, which do not interact, uh, are not caused by an interaction of a lightning bolt with the ground. And it, it, for me, it's no surprise at all why the production, the, sorry, the elements in the crust are the elements that you see uh, created in this process. The oxygen, the silicon, the aluminum and the iron and the calcium and I've already shown you that the magnesium can come in there as well so it is no surprise why these elements here and actually if you start by looking at exotic vacuum objects and you run the equations in the Parkmov MFMP Philip Power reaction calculator you will see that you rapidly end up with the oxygen and the silicon and the carbon and so forth from starting from lighter elements. And so I believe that it is inevitable that a crust of the composition of that of Earth would be formed in a suitable atmosphere in a suitable habitable, habitable zone. And I believe that the same technology could be technologically uh, used and uh, uh, employed to do um, uh, terraforming. So I've talked about making the elements f able to support life, but I'm also talking about making the elements to actually support life, as in you can walk on them <laughs> because it's like silicon, oxygen, aluminium and iron and calcium. The these make up your rocks. Uh, these are the rock forming elements. And so that is basically my he thesis. So um, uh, there we go. Uh, and, and it's because you have this in the air. Okay. Now we didn't include an argon that could produce some interesting uh, um, other sort of considerations because argon is so close to uh, calcium uh, and it can ionize. So th there may be some exchange reactions that yield calcium from that, but I, I don't think it's necessary. I think uh, what I have done, uh, I think, it, it, to my satisfaction, whether it's to your satisfaction or not, it doesn't, uh, you know, <laughs> it's... It's, it's what I'm proposing, is that you can make these elements um, and uh, uh, make the silicon from here and make the silicon from here, the other elements there, the silicon from here, the, the calcium from here and the iron from here in bang, 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 easy steps using nitrogen and carbon uh, as the principal fuel, fuels. You see, it's, it's interesting, I, I'm actually including, uh, uh, just for the record, in these queries here, 
Uh, not this one. This is just straight nitrogen, nitrogen. But in these queries, I am including oxygen, but it doesn't factor except in this bottom one here. Nitrogen and oxygen here produces silicon 30. Uh, in these reactions, oxygen does not fill, fit factor in producing all of the isotopes or the majority of isotopes in calcium. And here again, you do not see oxygen factoring in. But it may be that oxygen is critical as a substrate uh, for forming the uh, um, itonic clusters, the uh, ball lightning structures. Okay, so what does what does this imply? Well, for me, um, this implies that if you were, for instance, to use a sapphire type experiment or an experiment similar to the Vega experiment, that nitrogen, nitrogen could be an extremely good fuel, an extremely good fuel. And is that why the rather simple, just basically rough pumped experiments of, um, uh, what, how should we say this, of the Vega experiments of Henk and Day seem to be so successful in producing these kind of ball lightning uh, structures in there that we've seen in extreme details. And these coherent matter wave, in my opinion, coherent matter traveling waves are, are coming out uh, of these exploding coherent matter ball structures. Is that why? Because they've got nitrogen in there. And could this be something we can also learn, learn uh, from when doing ultra experiments where we have also seen the production of these uh, structures, these, uh, how should we put them, these crenelated spheres. So in the ultra experiments we saw the production of these crenelated spheres here and uh, this was using aluminium. So we were starting with aluminium and light water which was exposed to air. So there is air in the mix during these experiments. That means you've got nitrogen and oxygen possible to interact at the surface of the aluminium where the coherent uh, sound and the, the, the nodes of the sound waves are cohering the matter, in my opinion. And uh, it's interesting that you see these carbon, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon and iron being synthesized and on these spheres. And these are very, very similar to the crenelated uh, 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 iron-rich mag magnetic spheres that were seen produced from ball lightning. Okay, so my question is, can we enhance the ultra experiments, for instance, by in uh, dissolving into the water some fertilizer? Well, now, what fertilizer? I'm talking about potassium nitrate. You know, that sort of thing that produces nuclear bomb-type look explosions yeah, potassium nitrate, like uh, happened in, I think it was in Lebanon most recent, recently. Um, and then you could ask yourself, why does it do that? Well, people know that it's part of, like, uh, saltpeter, it's part of gunpowder, isn't it? You know, it's, it is a key component to explosives. this. But one asks, you know, it's likely that it's producing temperatures over a thousand degrees. So it's likely that it is going to be producing cold neutrinos, relic neutrino. Uh, uh, equivalents. But putting that aside, could we increase the amount of nitrogen that's available in the water in ultra experiments by putting, dissolving a little bit of saltpeter, a little bit of potassium nitrate into the mix? And could that result in us producing a far greater abundance of uh, these crenelated iron spheres? That is a question for those people that like doing ultra experiments. Uh, on there, and I think we've got one in the house. I, I think I, I saw uh, a ultra experimenter in the house. So, did you catch that? Did you catch what I'm saying, um, Martin? Are you still with us, Martin? <laughs> I hope you're still with us because I'm, I'm I'm letting you know this. <laughs> okay. Right. Um. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to work. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to work through the questions here. Oh, Martin, fantastic. So, tr I'd be interested to see if you start with aluminium. Now, I've got some data from Bin Jen Pang on the um, 
on the copper foils that he did with an ultra experiment and he's got some eds data from that and I'm, I, I'm going to do that in the next presentation. I might do that tomorrow or I might do that Tuesday. Um, but it's absolutely stunning. I suggested what it might be that he was finding and it's exactly what he found. So um, this is all becoming a little bit boring. It's been a bit boring for a while. But, um, you know, it, it just occurred to me that we, we are having a lot of extremely good data with coherent matter structures, in, in my view. And uh, um, before I walk into that too much, I, I thought I needed to address uh, some of my um, challenges to the prevailing theories about how uh, ball lightning is made, the Abrahamson Dennis theory and the Kapitza theory and so forth, um, because I don't believe it adequately explains the elements that are formed in here. Uh, I believe they are formed and that they, they are not necessarily captured uh, from interaction with the ground. Um, so I had to do this first, but I, yeah, probably it might be tomorrow or, or, um, uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, uh, Tuesday rather. Uh, okay. So just joining, oh, Blues Doctor, basically, uh, just, just a quick crap, cat recap for Blues Doctor cause he's just joined us. <laughs> uh, the long and the short of it is in the spectrum of, um, uh, in the spectrum, okay, I'll do this before my camera dies. So in the Chinese spectrum, which is on Wikipedia, and in this paper, which I've given here in physics review letters, they captured part the way through, uh, part a little short duration after formation, or some duration after formation, a ball lightning, which oscillated at 99.4 hertz. The oscillation was recorded in the nitrogen and the oxygen lines. Throughout the entire uh, um, uh, uh, observation, they saw uh, silicon and iron, and through all of the observation, other than the very last couple of frames, they saw silicon, calcium, uh, uh, and iron, and uh, and that that was that. The very last two lines to go were silicon and iron, and I argue that that is because they are the core. And uh, silicon is produced before calcium is produced, and and then calcium leads to the production of iron. Okay, and the oscillation of this is either because of and someone can work this out, and it might be a fun paper, and you can probably get it. Uh, uh, published in Physics Review Letters uh, because this paper was published in Physics Review Letters and I think the Abraham Dennis uh, paper, Abrahamson and Dennis paper got, I think it was in Nature or maybe even, I don't know, it was in a very, very big paper. But I, I believe that the nitrogen and oxygen oscillation is due because of the co core, the coherent matter sheath core, uh, uh, during the, the either the zero point or the po positive and negative uh, high tension uh, um, 50 hertz approximately power line that was 20 meters away allowed for um, uh, either high energy photons or beta particles to come out of the cohering matter and interact with the nitrogen and oxygen in the air and that caused the observed oscillation which you can see um, in the paper which I have here uh, and so this shows the oscillation here. So you, you, you don't have it here, then it comes up and then it goes away. And this happens uh, in a 99.4 times per second. And then right at the end of the thing, you just get this silicon peak and this iron peak down here. And that the production of the matter is, is due to uh, uh, carbon and oxygen, which are both in the air, but not in abundance, but we can make more carbon uh, that uh, fuses to silicon or preferably um, you just need uh, isotopes of iron and I need to flick, flick to a different window. Uh, here we go. So isotopes of um, nitrogen. So nitrogen 14, nitrogen 14 uh, produces more carbon and oxygen and some aluminium and hydrogen. And then uh, nitrogen 14, nitrogen 14 fuses to produce all the isotopes of silicon, all, all the isotopes of nitrogen form all the isotopes of silicon. And nitrogen 14 and oxygen, the two most abundant isotopes of both in the air, can also synthesize silicon 30. When you have those, you can produce 
uh, all of the isotopes of uh, calcium and when you have the isotopes of well the ma majority and then when you have uh, the isotopes of calcium you can synthesize with more nitrogen all of the isotopes of iron and there you go that that in my view is the story of uh, how this particular um, signal was produced and I'm arguing that um, uh, where are we The same process leads to the abundance of the elements in the crust, and they are oxygen, silicon, aluminium, iron, calcium, so on. Okay. Um, uh, yes, you, you could, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll start from the bottom upwards. Uh, because of water vapor, you would uh, uh, get tiny, tiny trace amounts of everything below uh, iron. Then, right? Yeah, yes, that that is true. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, in the Amasa vibrator plates, I am saying that you are producing a, a lot of the light elements, and they are in very small and very uh, quant, uh, very small sizes, even down to single atoms. And I believe that they are very bioavailable. Uh, 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 when they're freshly formed, um, uh, you you may produce lead uh, um, in extremely intense coherent matter uh, structures. In fact, if you look at what um, Adamenko did, and you look at what uh, Leclerc did, Adamenko in an electrical discharge into a target. Uh, one tenth of the speed of light and 300 joules into a little metal target. He got all elements in the periodic table and some elements of 455 AMU that do not exist in our near universe. Uh, and so uh, you were able to s synthesize even all the transuranics. This was also observed by cavitation. And uh, if you do extreme cavitation, the level of intensity of packing into a small box leads you down this path of... Uh, um, being able to produce all, all of the elements uh, uh, that you don't want as well, that then fission back and produce radioactivity. So, But uh, ball lightning is not doing that. It's, it's very much more gentle. I think you might get some beta particles out and some relatively high energy photons, but little more than that. Uh, they wouldn't travel much further than the air that they ionize and produce those lines from nitrogen and oxygen. So you, you recall we most often found carbon, iron and silicon contamination in semiconductor processing. Well, I would argue it's what's what's going on. Uh, I know you discussed, um, uh, this is Blue's doctor, he's saying that you most often found carbon, iron and silicon. I would imagine there was silicon in uh, semiconductor processing anyway, if it was uh, silicon based, not uh, germanium or whatever, I don't know. But uh, yeah, th this is pretty sensible. Okay, Martin, uh, I'll see you later. Please consider trying the uh, uh, saltpeter, adding adding the potassium uh, um, uh, nitrate to your uh, experiments because I think you, uh, on my hunches, you may get a lot more production of iron. And if it does produce more iron, then uh, we're onto a winner with understanding ball lightning uh, through the coherent matter path. Okay, so, so are tornadoes fueled by Lena since the reaction with oxygen and nitrogen is so energetic? Yes, I believe that tornadoes are fed by Lena. I think what you get is a, a, a coherent matter structure at the top. That's spinning. And I think the Russians have calculated that the uh, um, that ball lightning, uh, natural ball lightning spins at between 40,000 and 100,000 cycles per second. So if you can imagine that that is the core of your tornado, um, because normal fluid dynamics can't explain the, the speed of wind speeds of, of a tornado. And I believe that it is because you have this, you have an, an extremely fast spinning structure. And uh, it, it also would appear to affect the mass of things around it. And that, that's something you need to consider um, as well. Okay. Uh, push energy in push in enough energy in and you can make all the elements yes um, yes self-sustaining fusion chains are likely to stop at iron this this is true you you do need to push it I think I think you can actually push it over to zinc reasonably readily 
um, but uh, t tends to stop at iron and you'll probably find that that also helps explain what we observe in the earth okay so I'm gonna go up through the chain see what questions you have also when uranium 235 splits it is consistent with what the products are um, uh, so yes when, if you're talking about uh, Leclerc he was clearly synthesizing uranium-235 uh, and higher elements because he was getting typical kind of uh, uranium-235 splits. And it, it might be that because uranium-235 is just an unbelievably beautiful element. I mean, it's just, it, it is the, uh, I think it's the, the shortest half-life uh, primordial isotope. Uh, um, sorry. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so it's, it's 0.3 of the length of the universe, or the claimed the length of the universe, and then potassium-40 is the next one. Uh, and obviously, what one literally splits in half, uh, and the other one um, uh, produces predominantly a uh, high energy beta, 1.55, uh, 1.1551, or something like that, 1.551 MeV beta. Um, Okay, carbon will build more heavy elements. Yes, carbon is a boson. It's a beautiful boson, uh, nucleus, and it's triple alpha. And essentially, it's just it's just an alpha stock. As it feeds in, it's, it, it, it helps build elements that are alpha conjugate nuclei. And in fact, um, if you have something like uh, um, fluorine as your, your base building block, um, then you can get alpha conjugate nuclei off fluorine. So, and I will show that in one of the experiments um, uh, that we did in Japan, the analysis of the uh, titanium that was pressed against the uh, PTFE, which is a polymer of hydrogen and fluorine. Um, uh, that, um, sorry, a polymer of carbon and fluorine. When you look at the elements that are synthesized by the coherent matter, the, the microball lightning that, in my view, caused that explosion and those uh, uh, crystals to form, um, you, you see uh, sodium-23 and so on. Th these isotopes, which are alpha, co alpha conjugate nuclei of, uh, um, uh, what do we call it, uh, uh, fluor fluorine. Okay. So, Gordon Doherty, isn't carbon also natural endpoint? So there may be a few such endpoints. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there are a few such endpoints, and, and the ones that I've identified are helium, uh, the car carbon twelve, um, uh, calcium forty, uh, and uh, obviously iron iron fifty six, nickel sixty two, um, aluminium twenty seven. I mean, you, you, you can just look at the, the crustal abundance here. The, the, these are el element endpoints, actually. <laughs> so the oxygen is a, a quad alpha. Uh, silicon is an endpoint. Aluminium aluminium's interesting because it is this... It's two fermions that get kicked out of the nitrogen-nitrogen fusion or, or, or uh, nucleon exchange reaction. Uh, and uh, it, it's quite a likely outcome, but it produces a fermionic nuclei. And and uh, and there is no other isotopes of aluminium. So what we found when we looked at um, Hutchison samples uh, in Russia, the the coral twist sample, it had nickel synthesized, but nickel is fifty. Uh, 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 sorry, nickel fifty eight, sixty, sixty one, sixty two, and sixty four. They are the isotopes of nickel, but the isotope of nickel sixty one was 3.7 times natural ratio on an octopo octopole mass spectrometer. And um, this was a piece of data standing out alone, which I pre presented in my poster session at ICCF 22, uh, until um, uh, Sabatomova replicated a similar finding in a uh, glow discharge between two plates. And I think she also observed the lead uh, that we observed, where um, lead is, is a 204, uh, 206, 207, 208 naturally and the 207 isotope I think was 70% more than natural ratio and uh, I think she observed something similar so um, this 
fed into my hypothesis that, that fermionic isotopes are sometimes ejected from the bosonic clusters that form in this coherent matter structures. And one of those is protons. And of course, the reaction between nitrogen and nitrogen produces protons. And another one of these ones, which is aluminium-27. These two fermionic nuclei get kicked out. And that's a perfect reaction. Two bosons go in, and they produce two fermions that come out. And there's this, uh, what is the reaction energy there? I showed it earlier. And, and so I think this is a, a it's, it's, it's a way of proton synthesis and it's a way of aluminium synthesis. And aluminium, 227 aluminium is confused to iron 54 as well. So uh, where did I show that? Here. So it's the, it's the exchange reaction here between uh, 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 nitrogen and nitrogen. And so you get this proton coming out and aluminium 27. So it's two fermions coming out. And... Um, the, this is what I've argued with the fact that in corona discharges, Tom Clater observed tritium. And the reason that is, is it's the, the only other fermionic hydrogen isotope nuclei before you get to helium, which is bosonic. And that's an alpha cluster. And, and then things build from there. So um, I, I predict that depending on the, the elements that you put into your Lena reactor, you can choose elements that would force the production of uh, uh, similar reactions like this, where you get two fermionic isotopes coming out as products. And uh, um, you, you end up with uh, uh, a lot of energy uh, uh, because these, these par particles are, sh they're not actually, it's aneutronic, firstly, this reaction here. And the energy the kinetic this energy over here 15.9509 mev is shared kinetically between the h1 and the aluminium 27 so the particles come out with this velocity they're like bullets so you can imagine actually if you had nitrogen in your air and you had exotic vacuum objects loaded for instance into a, some steel for instance that um, when you uh, um, excited the production of the, these uh, uh, nitrogen uh, uh, formed exotic vacuum objects on the surface of the steel, they would produce extremely energetic bullets of protons and uh, aluminium-27. And the aluminium-27 then would heat up the steel, right? And then the steel would oxidize with the other oxygen that's available in the air, and then you would have extremely hot single ice atoms of aluminium right next to iron oxide. And that would create nanothermite, which is uh, pretty impressive. So your nitrogen would and your oxygen would be your fuel and your exotic vacuum objects would be your mechanism. And you could literally turn steel to dust. Quite, quite cool, huh? <laughs> Uh, producing elements heavier than iron is endothermic process. Um, no, not really. It depends. It depends how you're doing it. Um, in, in exchange reactions, not so necessarily. So, um, uh, I mean, <laughs> you can, you can, if you generally, if you add a proton to uh, an atom and it, it steps forward in the periodic table, you're going to gain energy. Okay, so it's it's not true. It's, it's just the, in, in the case of iron 56, uh, it has, uh, oh God, is it the most binding energy or the least binding energy? I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's like an energy well. So you, you kind of have to, it, it's a nice structure in the physical vacuum. And so you have to put more energy in to kind of get things to go together. But if you actually get into fuse, you can, you can gain energy. So if I can actually run a query here. So uh, if, if, I, if I take... Um, we, we, let, let's fuse some stuff here. Let's let's fuse, uh, let's fuse some e e iron and um, is this fusion? Am I on fusion? Well, it's fusion. Fusion reactions here. So we do fusion and we'll have some hydrogen. Let's just put a proton into Fe and see if we get any results here. Okay, so just execute query here. And there we go. So we put a proton into iron. Uh, we get a, another isotope of iron. <laughs> okay. So uh, 
iron 58 so there we go with with a neutrino coming in from the left but if we have no neutrino involved we get iron going in uh, a proton going into iron and we end up with cobalt 59 which is the stable isotope of iron and we actually get 7.3653 million electron volts so it is not true to say that you have to put energy in to go beyond iron it's just that if you've got a whole bunch of nucleons and, uh, and you've got a lot of lighter nucleons, which you typically do uh, uh, when you're synthesizing matter, that it will always produce something in between, which will produce more energy. Um, and I think Leclerc said you need to get over un under 45%, I think it's under 45% carbon or over 55% carbon, something like that. Uh, of carbon before you start synthesizing elements beyond iron in his in his experience so the, the, in in short why i believe it stops at iron is because you've got lighter elements around it and you don't have the intense driving force um, uh, because if if more element and first and the other thing is our iron is ferromagnetic as well so if you've got um, lots of uh, lighter elements being pulled in to this coherent matter structure it's pulling them in um, you're going to have more nitrogen and more oxygen and so it's going to go and step towards iron and then that's going to be a more magnetic thing that's going to pull more nitrogen and more uh, and ionizing and more nitrogen and oxygen. But when you run out of the nitrogen and oxygen and maybe you had something else available, then maybe the ball lightning would, would uh, produce something else. But it, it does what it does. And that what you see is what it does in the observation, I believe, is uh, uh, what it does when you have that level of, of ball lightning, uh, that intensity of ball lightning. I think if you had a, a coherent matter ball formed from palladium and um, deuterium, for instance, like the singularity of Martin Fleischmann and Stan Stanley Pons, I believe in that instance, uh, you are going to produce a full spread of elements. And actually, many of the elements... Uh, so if I, if I look here, if I, I do that reaction now, um, we can go here. And instead of doing fusion, we'll do fission reactions. And uh, we'll just do palladium here, and we'll get rid of the. Um, uh, no, we'll do that, okay. And we'll just get rid of the uh, energy bracket. So if we do this, just the straight fission, um, palladium 105 gets uh, titanium and manganese 20 MeV and so on so this is one set of reactions but if we do a 2 to 2 reaction I mean like, like you've got 81 potential fission reactions there if you do 2 to 2 reactions here and we do palladium and deuterium for instance so let's put in just deuterium and we put in palladium okay execute query so I would imagine that if they anal if they could find the material that was left from the um, singularity of Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons, that there is a, there is a hundred rows here because it's limited to a hundred. If I take away the limit at hundred here, it'll probably go to a thousand because there's many more, probably more than that. Um, so oh no, there isn't. There's two hundred and fourteen rows here. And the most energetic is deuterium and palladium. 106 goes to chromium and uh, uh, chromium. So two chromium, 54 atoms, and you get 36. And, and in fact, when, when you look at palladium-deuterium experiments, you see all these elements being formed. And, and people are saying that they're coming from like somewhere else, but it's not. It's, it's this kind of reaction, this exchange reaction. And in fact, I think you can get a fusion reaction as well here with the and this is what they're more thinking about. But it isn't when you do palladium and deuterium, they don't just find fusion elements. <laughs> and as, as, I, as I've told you in the past uh, with Matsumoto, Takaki Matsumoto, uh, he saw the inside of his palladium uh, cathode in a way, uh, sorry, palladium anode, palladium, his palladium electrode, let's put it like that, um, eaten away and uh, all kinds of elements that are the kind of elements you're seeing predicted here. Uh, were observed in the around the void 
So here, deuterium and palladium confused cadmium and other isotopes of palladium. So there you go. And silver as well. This is this has been noted before. They, had, they have observed this fusion of silver uh, to like uh, palladium 105 to silver 107. I think Mike McCubrey has observed that in the past. Um, but they also observe all of these other elements which are a fission or a nuclear exchange reaction. What would we have to put at the bottom of a lightning rod to get gold? Uh, I would suggest that you would put the elements that the uh, um, the uh, alchemists use. And in fact, if you go to my uh, steam it, let me find my steam it here from a long time ago. Uh, where is it? Steam it um, at Homer Symbian, I think. Oh no, it might might be here. I, I have a, a blog called Making Gold. Let's find it here. Steaming, steam it, steam it, steam it. Uh, blog called Making Gold. Oh no, okay. So I'm going to have to go back to M at MFMP. Okay. So hot in here. <laughs> Was it in here? Making gold. Okay, so from three years ago. I would suggest, and I, I, I argue here, I, in fact, I used the early Parkamov reaction tables and was able to show within about 50 seconds that the, the alchemists were using the right elements. So you, you can go and have a look at this. So these are the elements the alchemists used, and I do the... So, for instance, if you have uh, calcium and bismuth and calcium and bismuth or potassium and bismuth, these are the top three reaction uh, energies. Uh, so these are the things that would be produced if you had maximum compression. Now, these aren't the only elements that are produced, uh, but this is the combination that w is most likely under a, a very small box to produce some proportion of, of gold. Uh, if you were to get the pressure exactly right, i.e. the intensity of the coherent matter, uh, the resonance of it, um, then uh, I, then you might get a situation where it's all converted to gold. Um, but really, it's a statistical thing. Uh, and so some will go one way and, and some will go to other elements. Uh, with uh, mercury, it's potassium. Uh, and uh, with... Uh, Basically, either potassium or calcium. So, so with uh, lead, it's potassium or calcium. So potassium or calcium. And this is what the, the uh, alchemists used. Okay, I'll go down to the bottom again and see where you're at. I, I think uh, sapphire are using titanium, uh, nickel, uh, and uh, nitrogen in the air, and uh, uh, prob probably oxygen and hydrogen. <clears throat> Done. Okay, <laughs> I don't know where I got to. So how was Switzerland? Uh, um, I will come back to Switzerland. In fact, part, part of the reason I'm doing this is because of things that I need to talk about from Switzerland. Um, but um, I will come to that <clears throat> during, the, during the week. Uh, um, we, we replicated some of the uh, stuff that we observed in Japan, but I have these 4K 60 frames per second captures from I think we had up to seven cameras going um, and I need to just do some video editing to get those done and then uh, some interpretation and <clears throat> um, there, there were some problems I'm going to talk about the, the problems we had and it's not easy doing HHO uh, uh, even when there's no one dying 
Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we had to overcome several things. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk about that and I'll, I'll show you the videos that some really amazing things. And it also speaks what, what I'm doing in this presentation. You'll you'll see when um, I do some presentations on the Bin Huang copper ultra experiment and uh, the uh, experiment we did on the calcium. Um, uh, some things turned up in the spectral lines and it was just amazing to see them uh, predicted uh, uh, by the reaction calculator and so uh, on the 20th I'm going to take that sample uh, and look at it under the EDS and if we see uh, these elements there which you will find out this week um, then um, it's going to be pretty pretty darn interesting because it would look like um, uh, it's producing uh, uh, nuclear transportation and the interesting thing about this is straight up when you put the HHO gas I'll give you this right now when you put the HHO gas on the um, <clears throat> calcium carbonate the temperature goes <clears throat> sorry to over 2200 degrees C and we already know that um, uh, according to Alexander Parkhamov that cold neutrinos are formed when the temperature exceeds 1000 degrees C and uh, I think actually the temperature topped out at the capability of the spot pyrometer that we were using and so it could be higher than that and I think when you get up to the temperature of 100 watt tungsten filament light bulb you're looking at nearly 45 to 50 percent of the matter is producing cold neutrinos and uh, if that's in a coherent blob and you're you're throwing more tritium at it I think this might be very 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 effective at getting rid of tritium waste. Uh, so James is talking about making heavy elements and then making lighter elements. I would think you want to avoid making heavier elements. Like I said, um, anything that's not uh, uh, bosonic likes to get kicked out uh, in a higher concentration of the uh, coherent matter condensate, in my understanding. And so if you, I don't know, I can't, uh, maybe I can look on the Parkamod reaction table to see if... Um, uh, here if, we, if you want to find out if something is a bosonic nuclei or a fermionic nuclei I I had um, Philip a number of years ago add that into the reaction table so you can actually go to show element data here and uh, we do have some radioactive isotopes in there and one of them is uranium uh, because it's used so much so if you go to uranium down the bottom here it'll give you the um, uh, the status of uranium-235. So you've got uranium-235 here, okay? And that is a fermionic nuclei. So I would be concerned, if I zoom into that, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, see, uranium uh, A number is 235 and the nuclear uh, status uh, is fermionic. So I would suggest that if it was producing isotopes of uranium, it would produce these uranium-235 uh, atoms. And because the structure tends not to remediate, it can take anything and make it into carbon, right? So that it can do that. But um, uh, if it kicks out this 235, uh, then it might be causing radioactive decay and you, you, you end up with a hot stuff. Um, which is not necessarily what you want. So I, I, I wouldn't suggest doing that. And, and in fact, Leclerc and his part, uh, uh, business partner nearly killed themselves with just a one-hour exposure uh, to their um, uh, cavitation system. I'm, I'm minded to call it coherent nuclear transmutation, um, but, uh, you know, I, I prefer to call it Lena because that's what most people call it. <laughs>
So how, how important acoustic or radio frequencies? I think anything that leads to coherence, James, uh, will lead to the production of coherent matter. And that, uh, if is intense enough uh, and driven enough, that will lead to the uh, kind of lone genuclear reactions we have been talking about. Yeah, Mercury, I don't know if you saw, it was HG in the um, uh, making gold. And yes, uh, again, it's potassium and, and uh, calcium. Sapphire is the new electric non-atomic model of the sun. It's electric, Bob. Wait a sec. Okay. Uh, I, I, I know it's heritage, yes. Um, I would, uh, uh, James, I don't think that HHO will produce hot stuff because it has a constant uh, flux of, of the makeup of the water gas. And so it has a large amount of light nuclei constantly interacting with, with the formation of the coherent matter. And so uh, that that won't yield the kind of intense um, production of heavy elements. In the case of uh, Leclerc, Leclerc was focusing the electrons onto a tip. That causes electron bunching. When you have electron bunching, you cause coherence in the electrons, first by the formation of Cooper pairs, and then that Cooper, those Cooper pairs all form a condensate. Uh, and so that that is a very very intense condensate okay um and so you get all the elements in the periodic table and some that are outside of it including the radioactive elements in the case of leclerc he had this aluminium and uh, uh this cavitation on the aluminium and you can get this with hydrosonic pumps as well the the cavitation is constantly occurring on the um the cut holes on the edge of the cut holes so it's occurring in one place exactly in the same place but incredibly incredibly intensively and and so it doesn't get a chance to recover and so it just rapidly goes through the periodic table um, and and it produces a lot of strange radiation and they observe this even I think even outside their lab but the strange radiation if it is cold neutrino condensates as the Russians think it is then that can go into your body and it can cause the beta particles to come out of your carbon-14 which is part of the sugar molecules that hold your DNA together and also the potassium-40 in your body and produce that high energy 1.551 mega electron volts uh, beta particle and the, the combination of the two you know if carbon is in your sugar molecules your DNA is being converted to nitrogen it's not what it should be anymore and uh, um, you know that's shredding your DNA and the other one will be de killing white and red blood cells so uh, you, you don't want that going into your body and that's one reason why I've spent so long not testing certain equipment <laughs> like the supernova until I understood the radiation Okay, so I think I'm going to call it a night because I am sweating buckets. Um, uh, I think uh, um, we we have demonstrated a a, a mechanism. Uh, I believe it's through coherent nuclear transmutation uh, uh, from the macro ball lightning structure that is using predominantly nitrogen and to a lesser extent oxygen, but predominantly nitrogen in the air to synthesize the silicon, calcium and iron that are observed in the spectral lines and that this is the core coherent matter body that produces the ionizing radiation that cyclically ionizes the nitrogen and oxygen around it produce, to produce the 99.4 hertz lines. 
I think that um, this model can explain why you can produce these, why why John Hutchison could produce these, and why uh, um, uh, other authors such as uh, George Eagley uh, uh, are able to produce similar structures in uh, uh, reactors, and why the Hestalen lights and the video that I shared of the Australian outback uh, um, ball lightnings both of which are not formed during lightning or predominantly not formed during lightning uh, and uh, in fact I have uh, a conversation uh, between me and Aid uh, discussing this very point and I think I'll close out on that um, uh, because uh, I think it's quite nice so I hope it picks up on the microphone the conversation so this was from a video that I made uh, interviewing him uh, some time ago ball lightning in the Australian outback you can see on our YouTube channel I'll just play this segment here one uh, the Israelis uh, I think they, they, they did a study uh, where they um, <clears throat> uh, concluded that a ball lightning could be produced when lightning comes down goes into the ground it makes uh, carbon, carbon from trees and, and silicon dioxide into you know, ju just carbon, pure carbon and silicon, and the ball comes up and um, uh, then produces a, a thing that continues to burn and feed itself. Uh, it's a stable structure because of the, the, the uh, torus, um, but it, it feeds itself by just mm -hmm. burning slowly oxygen in the air. Now, you, in all of what you've described here, you've not mentioned anything to do with lightning. and. Uh, that is the same with uh, no. the Hestal and lights. So you've never seen lightning connected to or in relation to your ball lightning that you've observed. No, no not not at all. Um, summer summer is the uh, storm season when lightning occurs, um, and when we do see the reduced amounts of ball lights in summer, it's <laughs> never in relation to a storm or lightning. Unfortunately, so. I'm sorry, it's not. No, 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 it's just data. So, um, I mean, okay, so that was Aid uh, with his wonderful Australian uh, draw there. Um, and uh, he's confirming the fact that there's no lightning involved with the production of the ball lightning that he regularly sees. And so, yeah, there has to be another mechanism. He, You can see from the images that I. Uh, worked with from that uh, uh, recording <clears throat> that it is the same colors that were uh, discussed in the Chinese paper uh, that has been reported for other ball lightning recordings and so uh, uh, you have a situation where the Abrahams and, and Dennis might possibly explain a few accounts of ball lightning but they are it's not necessary and I believe because we know from other experiments that we can synthesize elements by creating this coherent matter that uh, since ball lightning is what everyone's referring to when the you know Takaki Matsumoto says that the, the, the atonic clusters are micro ball lightning and Ken Shoulders saying that EVOs are equivalent to ball lightning and the Russians are saying that lone G nuclear reactions or cold nuclear transmutations as they call them uh, are in, intrinsically linked with ball lightning in fact that's the name of their conference um, I, I, I can uh, pretty much uh, be confident in saying that uh, the observe observation is explained by the fusion and nuclear exchange reactions uh, by predominantly nitrogen in the air and therefore this tells you that nitrogen could be an extremely important Lena fuel. So thank you very much and I will see you in the next video. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them on the uh, blog at remoteview.icu where they will be persistent. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now.